I think we're good. Hello, everyone, and welcome to This Week in Hospitality Marketing, live show number 379. I'm your host, Lauren Gray, and thank you, thank you, thank you for the privilege of your time joining us today. If you're doing so live in all the countries that we're in, we transcribe our uh, live show recorded um, to 11 languages. We're uh, published to 39 uh, countries that we are aware of. We do know that we broadcast globally on our TV channel, Hospitality Channel, which you can get on Roku, Amazon, Apple, and Google, Amazon, Amazon, Apple, and Google, Amazon, Apple, and I'm missing the fourth one, and it's blinking out for me. Anyway, we're on all the smart TVs, if you put it that way. Plus, we're also we're simulcasting, as we always do live, on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube, on multiple pages and channels. If you're joining us on the HSMAI Facebook Live platform, welcome. And for those that are following us on other uh, platforms, such as Cogwell Marketing and Others, thank you for joining us as well. Today's topic um, is topical, uh, really with the, the midterm elections just having rolled through this week. And by the way, before I even begin to start, uh, a very proud and happy and thankful Veterans Day, November 11th. Thank you all uh, for, to our veterans for keeping us safe and making the commitment that you have uh, to protect us. Thank you very much uh, for uh, all of that. And more notably, and on a day like today where we get to acknowledge you, uh, with celebrations and things that are happening because of it and the holiday for it. So uh, very thankful for Veterans Day for everyone uh, that is in our military. So with the midterms having just rolled this past weekend, uh, week, and of course, they're still in flux. We're still waiting for finalized results. And I believe there's going to be uh, a redo in Georgia for a runoff uh, for uh, that, which actually has a, a huge power shift. Uh, I, it's strange enough, but I don't know whether it's an apathetic perspective or not, but historically... We never had such a focus on politics, midterms and or general elections, unless they were notably like for presidents, um, sometimes for governors. Uh, but the whole genres of school boards and city councils and uh, the locality and then escalate up to the state, uh, state level Congress and, and senates and governors and uh, so forth. Uh, there was always an interest, and I think obviously some people were more in, in getting involved with it, but never to the level that it is now, the the, the balances of power, because we're so polarized. Uh, that polarization is a little bit of what we want to discuss in today's topic, and translated obviously to the purpose of their show of hospitality marketing. Um, the topic I want to tackle today is the politics of travel. Um, it seems like an odd pairing, uh, politics and travel. Uh, we often don't think about how politics uh, is so ingrained into our travel choices, our travel logistics, and the influence that politics and political decisions have in everything that we do in relationship to travel. Uh, not just how we operate our businesses and our entities within the hospitality industry, restaurants and and hotels between getting permitting and zonings and so forth, although those are politically designated and designed, <clears throat> but also the influence on the traveler, their choices, uh, their influences as to what they are looking for doing and those things that make it more reasonable for them to consider one thing versus another. Politics has become more and more a part of that. And again, going back to our initial uh, point of starting the show is because of the very large polarization in our politics now, uh, again, being older, uh, looking back on the times, uh, it was always a bit of a running joke that, you know, don't discuss religion or politics over Thanksgiving, uh, because that's the fastest way to not come back for Thanksgiving and or not have a pleasant Thanksgiving and having to put up people's opinions in politics and so forth and so on. It's now turned militant in many, many ways. There are families that are sworn to not speak to each other uh, but you know Hatfields and McCoys of the of the old days of uh, you know the rivalry in the, in the Appalachians um, we have gotten to being from tolerance of uh, uh, someone else's opinions and still being related to them or friendly to them to uh, intolerance that either you agree with my politics or you're not a friend of mine, or I disagree with you and you're forever not a friend of mine. Uh, if there's this, this the, for those that are Star Wars fans, it's the idea of the Sith and dealing in absolutes. Uh, you have to agree with my political perspective, or we can't be anything other than distant because we can't be friends. We can't have any other common ground. Either you believe what I have completely or not. That polarization has created a lot of 
very hard lines between the opposites of the perspective, whatever that perspective is, that they're disagreeing about. Um, there is a lot of things now that influence the need for travel. Um, also, too, let's talk more also with the politics right now. There are certain things that happen in a progression when 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 um, elections occur. Uh, markets respond to election results. We've known this for time and mortem since we've had stock market and political activities. Um, there's usually a rally of one side or another relationship to the results of a general election, um, when national elections in, in midterms like we just had. Um, usually that's because that means that the policies that are restrictive to corporate's perspective of values have changed. The, the climate has changed as to what direction uh, legislation and litigation is going to happen. And so they rally for that, but knowing that there, there's a better opportunity for things to happen for them or that it recoils in one way, but it, you know, there's always one half of the side that always wins. So the people that weren't happy with the results of the election business-wise aren't as aggressive about their growth ideas compared to the other side that was happy for the results of the election and did. But there's usually a rally that happens after uh, the midterms or general elections that occur uh, every two years midterms and then general elections, sorry. Um, and for that reason, we're, ha we're experiencing that now. Uh, it, it, they, they tried it off in, in the concept that the, re the recession numbers went down a notch rather than going up. Uh, everyone, that is the focal point, pivot point of most of the business discussions of this. But before any of all this happened, there were some things that happened in the economy with our large uh, corporate entities that made me pause and wonder, what is it that they know that we don't know? And this again, going back to the politics of travel, the they they have very very smart people that don't share publicly how they do these things. They 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 sell what they do, or they hire the people to tell them what they need to know as to the forecasting of what is happening in a very macro way. If anybody remembers going to college, there was a macroeconomics and microeconomics, um, small and large scale, or large and small scale, as to uh, the effects on what you're looking at. Macroeconomics was countrywide, nationwide, globally, so forth. Macroeconomics, large scale economics. And those people that are in tuned to looking at those indicators have had amazing tools given to them recently. The, the, with the AI and, and, and massive large scale uh, quantum, well, quantum computing isn't fully engaged yet, but um, you know, huge computers that can then help, that can work with the process of sorting through undescribable amounts of big data to see trends that didn't exist before because we didn't see them in correlations. The old adage of chaos theory of a butterfly's wings flapping on one side of the world and a hurricane and as a result on the other, those correlations of events. And you have places like Amazon and Walmart that early before our holiday fourth quarter season has started has frozen growth in the sense of their, their staffing, their hiring. And this, kind of made me go hmm, a little bit of a red flag as to normally, historically, um, this is the time of year of at least temporary hiring expansion, where we need more people because we are going to have a larger demand on our services. Then for them to not and actually stop the growth of that, that hiring force means that they saw things in the tea leaves, so to speak, uh, of what would make them think that it would be an unwise financial decision to do so. You look at large organizations such as Marriott, large organizations, uh, the social media organizations are going through this right now. Facebook just dropping 13% of their um, total staff, thousands of, thousands of people. Twitter, of course, Elon Musk doing whatever Elon Musk is doing these days, um, dropping off half the staff of Twitter and so forth. There is an, uh, a reduction to create efficiencies of finances. They're not doing this uh, to, to, to be supportive of their people. They're doing this to, to the survivability of the, uh, the entity of the company. Um, they're, they're shrinking down because they see in the future things that means that that was a wise choice now to create. So what are they seeing that we can possibly see? We don't have those people giving us the information that are being given to them. So we have to see what they leave as shadows as to what's affecting our decisions for our hotel, our group of hotels, our restaurant or restaurants, and see what those things are um, and see whether or not we should make those same types of decisions or whether we should be able to, as we say on the polarization, one man's loss is another man's gain. Well, how can we 
for lack of a better word, exploit the opportunities that are present in the current economy. So I wanted to lean into this political effect on travel in a multiplicity of ways. Uh, first off, I went through the Captain Obvious conversations as to what influences travel decisions for people that travel, uh, that politics has influenced. <clears throat> One of the most, the easiest ones to point out is that there is a huge diversity right now, polarization, as to uh, the rights of women. And uh, we just had in the midterms, several states because of the Roe versus Wade refu uh, refugiation by the Supreme Court um, that have decided to put it on their bill their docket for the past election. And every state that had it on their docket was able to pass their own state level preservation of women's rights. Good for them. Um, that doesn't mean the entire country, it means that state. So now you have a, a state over here that doesn't do that. Uh, let's take Texas. It's a great example. Um, that uh, are on the stream of like, no. Okay. And they were actually trying to chase down people and try to pursue whether they're even looking at traveling to a state that did and correlating whether it was because of the causation of what they were going for and thinking they were going to try to create some criminal intent to that, which is mind numbing to think. Anyways. But you have a state that's adjacent or nearby to them that uh, that is open to uh, women's choice. And then you have a state that isn't. A person now is faced with what they're wanting to do. That's a travel decision for them because they can't facilitate what their choice is in their own location. So they have to go to a place that allows them to express their choice. That requires travel. Now, not that's just an example of the politics influencing on travel decisions. We're not going to go with marketing uh, towards that. And so I think there's a, there's a bit of a self evidence to that. Um, it's the idea that these are influencing factors for choices of travel. Uh, there are other things uh, here in Florida. We have the, the the colloquial "don't say gay" ruling that's out. Uh, we have a governor that anyway. Um, there are communities, bastions of LGBTQ. Uh, uh, tea, uh, communities that are, I wouldn't say, I would say, you know, they're, they're, they're being cast in an unfavorable way. If you're part of this community, your travel choices are more about places that you feel comfortable and welcomed to go to without it being prejudiced as to your preference of life. And those things are, are travel choices that are influencing. Um, where, what communities have strong local communities that you can feel warm and comfortable and most importantly safe in that are that are not where you feel out and ostracized and or judged or perceived as outside of the context of what the local community is welcoming. Um, others are ethnic diversities, densities of ethnic groups. Um, unfortunately, we have in our society the, the, the ugly specter of racism and biasness. We have anti-Semitism. Um, we, we have these things that are in, in news coverage a lot. Public figures defining their perspectives where they have no right to have an opinion and share it publicly because of the influence they have on so many people um, that are feeding and fueling these things. And that has an influence on those ethnic uh, groups as to what they like to go to and be at for the very same reason the LGBTQ and other communities that look for densities of acceptance, wel of uh, welcomingness, openness and capability of being safe. Um, they have an influence on their travel decisions. Um, and these all are things that are usable from the perspective of your business as to how do you stand on these things in your community? How do you stand on these things for the people that you want coming through your door? Because all of the things we're discussing have the ability to be identified in some classification of context that allow you to identify what you want them to know about your business. I'm not here to push you to one side or the other. You can tell obviously my personal things, by the way, I react and say things, but the idea of it is, is that you operate a business in your community and your community influences, if not sometimes directs how your business markets itself because you don't want to be the one that um, is working counter grain to your community. Now, some people relish in that, and I applaud those people that do, um, to keep solid to your own desire to run how your business is run. Uh, but, you know, as with anything, a village runs a village. 
and you need to make these choices and who you bring in your door and what you bring them in for have these influences of ethnicity, uh, lifestyle preferences, um, religious preferences, um, decisions as to rights. These are things that are politically controlled by what's been voted into the local market and in the states and so forth that now influence whether or not you have the inclusion of an audience that you can uh, talk to or an exclusion of an audience because you realize that you're only creating more issues and um, problems for trying to, to chase after them. And again, it, everyone runs their business in a way that they might, you might, might want to be the vanguard. You might want to be the contra to your community. You, by then, you might also be wanting to be a, you ardently believe in the community's perspective of things, and you want to make sure that people are aware of the localization of that interest, whatever it may be, good or bad, both sides of the coin. There is these things that influence political travel. Um, there are more things that go to these that are that are also becoming more influential in people's travel decisions. Uh, I think back to the old times uh, when travel choices before the internet was done by brochures and rate cards and library visits and looking up with destinations and looking at paper maps and making little lines on roads and getting AAA trip tickets and so forth. The things you didn't ask about much, other than maybe the concept of safety, was crime rates. Okay. Um, how safe or how volatile is the area that you're thinking about traveling to? Is there a, a, a issue going on in that market that will be something that um, makes it not enjoyable for you to be there? That you're, there's a safety concern? Um, is there, there there's some sort of things that are making the news and or is a hot spot of problems for where you're thinking about traveling to? Or maybe that you don't fit into what the community is uh, about and you feel that that would create an unsafe environment for you because they would identify you as being outside of what they feel as something they want to welcome in. Um, it makes for, for choices that didn't exist even just a few years ago. I'm not saying that people didn't want to be curious as to whether or not they're going into a crime riddled zone, but you didn't know, it wasn't put in front of so many people so often as to uh, the notifications of what was going on. We have so many things now that, that influence so many things. You have um, the nest and the rings and the, the, the cameras and the, the, the neighborhood stuff, next door stuff that you can look at and see exactly all the crime reporting that's going on in an area. You can see the crime ratios. You can see little dots on maps now of when, what happened when and where and where there's a safe areas, not safe areas, so forth and so on. You can research the heck out of travel decisions with a, a massive amount of data that really wasn't available at the time. And people are using these things. And where does politics come into the crime rate? Well, it comes into whether or not the police are, are supported, whether there's rules that are being put in place that make it overt to enforce, whether there's a biasness to how things community-wise are perceived. There's a lot of intrinsic things that relate to the safety perspective of the traveler. And those are things that you really can't directly address in your content. And you certainly don't want to draw unnecessary attention by making it a point of content. But you need to make sure that your team, when talking to uh, people and their questions and their queries, to listen to the secondary sentence in the secondary conversation behind the questions. What is the inspiration of that question? Why would they be interested in knowing about those things? Is there a concern about something that they're not directly asking about? And from that, you can maybe at that point realize that it's necessary to share with them and be honest with about what would answer to the core question that may not be directly being asked. So this is where the translation of that comes into your, your team and your communication and your ability to um, talk with and engage with the guests that are interested in coming and staying with you, obviously coming to restaurants and so forth and so on. Then there's other things that politics influences on, and that is the policies that dictate how things get done. We have infrastructure problems. And as much as it's been flagged as, oh my gosh, that's trillions of dollars and so forth and so on, it really wasn't. It ended up being way smaller than that. Uh, still hundreds of millions, which is amazing in the sense of number itself. But we have bridges that were built in the 30s and the 20s that are still trying to run as if they were then with no little to no replacement or anything. We have tragedies that are happening. Down here firsthand, even the newer bridges like the Cinnabow Causeway and so forth, 
suffered damage simply because of the traumatic weather that we, we we just had with Ian and wiped out the accesses to the bridge. The bridge's integrity structurally were good, but the ability to connect to that bridge from the land side is what suffered. In some ways, it was built to have that happen. In other ways, it wasn't. But the idea that infrastructure has direct impacts. Only recently, one of our other sets of bridges had a structural question that they shut it down. Well, just that day to two days of it being a shutdown literally changed the dynamics of the heavy traffic in our area because of the lack of that bridge. Because as with all bridges or any of that infrastructure that we deal with, they have an impact on daily life. That require also the fact that there's railways and we had possible railway striking. And there's still a pending one coming through this holiday that there might still be a rail strike. And how is that going to impact our business? We had supply chain issues that we never really thought of as a consumer was even something worthy of discussion. It was not in our realm of influence, and yet it was nightly on the news for a very long time. We've seen dramatic impacts on baby formula for the longest time through the summer, which was terrible. And it, the impact on it, but it has a political repercussion, turns into a rallying cry for parties based on their perspective of it and who's responsible and so forth. These are influencing factors. I can probably guarantee you that people took trips because there was an opportunity to get something that they couldn't get in their market that was available in another market. That's how supply chain affects things that we have. Uh, just for the very same reason why we travel to different places that have different climates and different lifestyles than ours, because we're, we turn into a tourist. It's, it's funny that so many people don't want to look like a tourist. They want to blend in like locals and so forth. I, I was like that. I thought, oh, you know, I want to be more like a local. I want to no, I want to do and see the world the way a local sees in the sense of familiarity, preferences, uh, places that they like better than others. I want the knowledge, but I'm proud to be a tourist. I have the privilege of traveling outside of where I live to a place where somebody else does and try to understand it and, and enjoy it the way they enjoy it, to go to places that they enjoy, to see things that they enjoy. And that's the privilege of travel. And that's the, 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 the neutrality of travel is that that's a willing empathy of what is it like to be here? That joy of that is something we need to really spread. That's the part that we influence politics on. The more you travel, the more empathy you have, the more perspective outside of your own that you're willing to share. That politics of travel is just an esoteric one that we can talk about in a little bit too. But that, that has its value to it as well. Let's talk more about infrastructures and so forth. You have roads that may need repaired, bridges that may not be up to code. These are things that are now easier to find in our data-driven world. We can know that, you know, we can drive that, but so far they've had already two local warnings that the uh, water system doesn't always, you know, there might be a boil water coming up. There's just so many things that happen now that we have data-capable resources for. A lot of these things prior to the years now, were things that just happened locally that may have not even been known locally because there was no venue to tell people about it. If it didn't make the local paper or the local radio station or even a bigger market a local TV station, you wouldn't know about it. Unless a neighbor said, oh yeah, Bob down at the water plant says that uh, we should be careful with the water. You know, hearsay and word of mouth is what they will probably, back in the day, you would have probably gotten. And if even then, okay? So these overwhelming pieces of data of all the things that happened, all of these are driven by the politics of choice, the polit politicians that are put in place and the choices that they make. How a, a city or a county decides on property tax. Uh, just recently, it was on the ballot for the, the midterms of whether or not we are empowering the local council to waive property taxes for the solicitation of large businesses. Basically, bait the hook. We'll waive property tax if you want to build a big enough or something that we were looking for in our market. It, you know, you have both sides of the conversation. I'm not trying to talk about the very, but those things influence what gets put into your market. I know of many places like Florida Keys, Lumbo Key in Florida and so forth. There's an overwhelming perception of what we have, we want to keep and we don't want it to change. And that dominates their politics of opportunities for other hotels to be built or VRBOs to be used or timeshare capabilities, or even infrastructure issues. We don't want it to grow bigger, so we'll cut it off where we can't make it bigger by restricting cell towers or power uh, conduits that come to us or whatever. And that way they can keep what it is that they have the way that it is. There's a huge discussion locally here as well with Fort Myers Beach's devastation that there's so many people that say, oh, we want it back the way it is. 
The issue is, is that there's so much devastation. The rebuild has to get adjusted, just like what happened with Andrew when it hit Miami, um, that the rules will get changed as to what you can build back so that it is safer for it not to be a tragic loss as it was this time. And a lot of those places that want it back the way it was will not one be built the same anymore because they were not built in the way that they survived anyway, or they were built way back when. And because of that, there's a price factor and they may not be able to afford it to build it back themselves. And it might be forfeited to somebody that does have the finances to do it. And it changes the demography of who gets to have Fort Myers Beach. This is on and live and going right now. These are the politics of travel. What Fort Myers Beach becomes now is in the hands that of, of people that have the influence to make that happen. And influence is usually money. And so you're going to have these shifts and changes. And this is happening everywhere. I'm only taking that from the firsthand example of what I'm experiencing being a resident of this area. And because of that, these are the influences of travel. Other influences of travel, just in all honesty, the, the, just what happened down here with Ian hitting us in the Southwest Florida area, going through Florida, and coming out to the East Coast on the other side and creating damage all the way through and on the other side, and then only to have the East Coast, especially Volusia County, to be hit once again now with Nicole. The crisscross pattern that everyone's famously pointing out was the same that happened in 2004. Was here for that too, Charlie and, and Janine. Um, and we had other storms on them that uh, those two as well. Um, there are these things, and from that, how the infrastructure gets redone and how it's handled during the process of this of the of the rebuilding and so forth are critical components, but also the impact. Now, I remember this from when I was going uh, on, the, on the circuit with HSMAI's rocket program, Revenue Optimization, uh, Education and Convergence. Uh, Star, Smith Travel, um, Valerie, uh, not Valerie, um, Veronica was with us from Star Travel. And she had this amazing graphics chart that showed when, uh, oh, now I'm drawing a blank, it's the storm that hit Houston, the massive rainstorm. And it showed the ripple effect of occupancy, the loss of occupancy and where the occupancy went. Much like a, a something hits a, 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 a stone hits the water and there's the ripple effect. OK, and you saw this over the course of time of how the business went elsewhere. And then slowly it showed how it realigned and shifted back again. Um, that's happening now here for the southwest Florida. There is tens of millions of dollars in, in historical tourism income. That isn't going to happen in the imminent future. How long that imminent future is, is to be determined. But just let's just say this is not going to be a season uh, that normally we have starting now when it gets colder up north and people come south. People that are snowbirds that have places to live down here. Some of those houses were destroyed. Other ones, they find that there's no reason to come down because the infrastructure has been so affected. Restaurants not existing or being closed. Beaches not being able to be able to go to and so forth, they might find it easier to rent out their property to somebody that has been displaced and needs a place to live while they have the rebuild of their house and or whatever they're doing. Also, that means as a ripple effect that the restaurants that are open don't get the business they need, so they don't hire additional staff that they normally would. Then there's those that don't have a place to live that are those staff that they couldn't afford the places that are available right now. They have to leave the market because there's no place affordable for them to live, which was already was a problem. And now it's even more exacerbated um, because it ripples from who can afford it down to who can't. And so you're having a whole displacement of those people. They're going to go where there's a chance to get a job, that they have money, and a place that they can afford to stay while they do it. So where does that business go? And now we just had Nicole hit. So if you thought, oh, well, we got Tampa, Orlando, East Coast, Miami, South Florida, and so forth. Now you have damaging uh, aspects to other places as well. It might not even stay in the state. It might go elsewhere and so forth. And we're doing fun things, tracking data um, on airlift as to people's selections of airports of where they're wanting to travel to and traffic levels. Because we have data that we can see, that we can see the demand of search. What are they searching for and how that shifts? What flights are they looking for and how is that shifting? We can see, just like Veronica did with the STAR report that I was referring to, in, in uh, her presentation, the ripple effect of the impact of the storm as it displaces occupancies for travel. Obviously, we have heavy occupancies in our hotels, we know, for the recovery effort of teams and crews that are here to work on rebuilding what was destroyed. Those have their own in, in economic impacts to us. Um, with all of those things, there's a larger scope perspective of climate, and that is climate sensitivity, climate change. Um, 
we just talked about the results of storms, which, you know, is in effect a part of the climate uh, change. The storms are stronger and later and larger. Um, whether that's a trend or whether that's just a uniqueness of this year, we'll see next year. But the other is the actual climate change impact. Um, there are places that are now being unallowed to be rebuilt in Florida because in the zone flood tables, that area of land will not be safe to build on. The water level, the tide, the, the ocean level will have risen to a certain point at a certain time within a certain window that will preclude them from having a building there. So they're not allowing a building to be built there. That's affecting the draw of what brings people to markets in Florida where they can't go to these places with a place to stay because the places they stay, where they stay can't be built. So therefore they're not gonna go there as a choice. These are real impacts of what climate change is doing. Um, the, the, the going up north and seeing glaciers, the glaciers are receding. They're receding harder and farther. You think of Lake Powell and places that the water level is down, like and, and so forth. Those where you used to go and, and rent uh, a boat and, and be on the boat there and so forth. That isn't happening anymore. Um, Salt Lake City, Salt Lake itself. There's plenty of places that their draw as a as a destination tourism place is affected by climate change, and it's going to continue in whatever form. It's going to continue on. So we're having shift of demand where you may have built a hotel because you're right next to X, Y, Z, something like Powell or you know, whatever. And now the lake is way over there. And everything that you build about docks and boat rentals and everything else isn't there anymore. You've lugged it out, but you can't lug it that far. And people, whether you do your best intent of still accommodating interest of the, hey, we're still here. People might just say it's just not worth it. It's not as it's not what it was before. It's not what I envisioned. It's not what I thought I wanted to do. I'll pick another place, and that has real ramifications. Uh, I've always said with our marketing for any hotel for any location, it was built for a reason when it was built. Now is that reason still in existence? Has something replaced it, or has both of those things gone away and you have to find a new reason for the hotel? That's the three choices you have when it comes to your hotel. There's been plenty of of, of you think of Route 66. Uh, famous road was the way to get from Chicago to Los Angeles. And uh, you all of a sudden interstates start taking over and the interstates was not made on the section of Route 66. It was made somewhere else. And so all those businesses that were along Route 66, all the very famous places to stop and see and do and whatever have you, and to cater to the people that used the highway of America to get from there to there or in one section of it or not, now, the, the traffic disappeared. They dried up. They went over to the interstate. And new businesses were built around where those cross-sections were and those roads were. So people were accommodating the people that were on that road. Just like the railroads before that, that the houses and, and the towns were built along where the railroad was built because that created the infrastructure that they needed to get people to come there. We go through these transitions, but all of those choices, where the interstate was built, where you're allowed to build from zoning, uh, and all the, and, and the and the impact of property taxes and everything else like this is political. It's political choices that dictate that direction. If you have a community that has brought on into power a political arm of your local area that is not about growth of your area, but in sustenance and maintenance of the area in the sense that they want to keep what they have, then that is the political climate going forward. There is not going to be a new hotel. There's not going to be expansion of the same hotel. There's not going to be VRBOs. There's not going to be um, uh, the, the, the ability to timeshare because they're going to restrict the laws that say that nobody can lease out their spot more than once every six months and has to be for at least 30 days. Well, that immediately took out any VRBO or Airbnb one, two, three, five days stay because they have to be 30 days and you can only rent it once every third day. So you're going to look for one place that's one person that's going to be willing to rent it for as much time as they're willing to pay for it. These are the influences that politics have on travel. These rules and guidelines change the ability to actually accommodate the interest of people coming into your market as tourists. That goes into the idea also of, again, property taxes, rent regulations for the staff and the supporting staff. There was a huge discussion down here in Southwest Florida prior to Ian, and it only gets exacerbated more, that the people that that support the businesses, the, the servers at the restaurants, the front desk agents at your hotel, the housekeepers in your hotel, um, all couldn't afford 
to live close enough to where they were working because the prices of rent were so crazy. There was discussions locally, is there, is there a legal way for us to restrict or cap rents? And of course, uh, the council board didn't want to touch that with a hot potato because people fund pol political, you know, companies give money to uh, people that they want in power. Uh, they support them. You know, individual people might write a $200 check, a company will write a $2,000 check. And that's small potatoes compared to even larger entities and so forth. And so you have the fact that they're not going to go over and bite the hand that feeds them. And also, too, it is a two-edged sword with these decisions. It's not just that they're not being they're allowed to make a good decision because of, of those that sponsor them. That's bad enough. It's the fact that it's a potentially uh, two-way cutting blade. By restricting, restricting rental limits would also mean that there's less investment into the market because the less opportunity to generate revenue goes down because there's a cap as to what you can charge. So less interest of solving the long-term problem of having more housing come into the market because that's the best way to lower prices is to have more inventory. We know that from hotels firsthand. If you're the only hotel in town, guess what? 100% market share. If you have to start sharing your inventory with other hotels that have inventory, you have then your segment of market share. So more competition in the capitalist way of looking at things breeds price stability. However, if there's too much demand, and not enough inventory, and no short-term solution to that inventory, prices go high, stay high. And that's what was happening with all the supporting infrastructure requirements of people. It was sad to say the firemen and, and emergency service people and nurses and so forth, the backbone of the infrastructure that supports the people that are living here couldn't afford to be in the market and live because they weren't being paid enough to actually pay for the prices to rent places here. These are political things that affect travel because here's how it affects our travel. If I have a great restaurant, but I can't get enough staff for service. One, well, my service levels go down. Two, the people's interest in coming to my restaurant go down because of the service levels and the known entity of like, oh, that's a great place, but expect to be there for three hours because it takes that long to finally get food. That impact means the next time that they're planning on traveling somewhere, they're going, yeah, we can go back down there. But, you know, all the restaurants, they're always so crowded and there was never enough service and, and there was none of people in the stores and da, 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 da. You know, let's pick another place. That makes a difference. That goes into the idea of the infrastructures, the tax regulation, the, the taxes that people pay, the rent that they have to pay, the things that cost people to create the support that creates the entity, the village of what people travel to. Add to that things like corporate tax breaks um, and things that corporate companies are allowed to decide and choose on. Um, it, strangely enough, it's not just up to the company to decide whether you can work remote or not. There are some guidelines as to contracts and leases the legalities, not just from a business perspective, but from uh, a public perspective. So say, for instance, the company was given a tax break to have employees, that they were going to bring 200 new jobs to the market and they were given a tax break, property tax to do that. That company has a, a less opportunity to allow for remote working because those remote workers are not current, the local employees, meaning they're not living next to the company that they work for. They're not in the community that provides taxes and payments and, and, and money to spend at restaurants and money to spend at retail and everything else that supports the local economy. They're working somewhere else in the country. So that corporate, in order to keep its tax breaks or its obligation commitments, okay, might have to be less uh, available to allow people to work remote so they can maintain what it is that gave them the breaks to be there. It sounds like a strange little ripple, but it's true. These things do have influence where the companies were, you know, well, why is the company making me go back to, you know, to the office? You know, that's just crazy because they're leasing a certain block of space and they're under a contract to keep it for three years and only having 20% of the people occupied doesn't justify the cost of the floor. They say we need to go and make sure that we're using this space. Some were able to get out of their lease. Some of them plan to get out of their lease. Others have what I just described as a problem where their, their company, because of their tax breaks, they can't have less than a certain number of local employees. And therefore, they hire local first before they think about the extension of work remote if they have that as an option. These create issues. Again, things like zoning restrictions as to where businesses can be, hotels can be, whether or not they're allowed to build on the beach or they have to build past back, back from that. Um, you know, there's lots of things that impact, and again, by the local communities hiring of their political entities that run and operate their local communities. That's the nascent of how these things get handled. I give the examples of the Keys and Longboat Key and so forth, where these local communities don't want it to change from where they have. They want it to be kept as good as they have it right now, but they don't want to expand past that. They hire 
put people to represent them in that way so that it discourages expansions of hotels. It discourages expansions of retail or large buildings or, you know, there's the bane of the fact that people say, oh, we don't want to have uh, the canyon over in Boca Raton over on our beach. You know, you have that kind of personas that exist in politics that literally dictate the ability for people to be drawn to your market. There are people that love the Anna Maria feel. It's local, it's quaint, it's small buildings and so forth. That was Fort Myers Beach to some degree. But now with the Storm Ian that just, that just totally obliterated that, what it is to become will change the landscape of what uh, Fort Myers Beach will be as a tourist destination from this year forward. It will come to that end. So all of this discussion brings around a few things. What happens this January, 2023? So we've dealt with months of political junk on TV, political diatribe, political commentary, political forecasting, prognostication, impacts, threats, and we're still dealing with that. And unfortunately, Georgia has still more to deal with before they get to their decision point. Um, we have the year as it existed, how we started the year versus to where we are now. Uh, we have the political polarity of I vaccinate, I don't vaccinate. I believe in women's rights, I don't believe in women's rights. We have these polarities that are affecting people's choices and decisions. We have all these impacts, on, and, but what's happened now, or what is happening now, is that the entire duration of these events have now worked its way over a period of time that the impact of these things are beginning to now get expressed into the effects of our businesses. It's one thing to say this happened, but then there's the, the effect ripple. They, now that it landed, what happens after that? And come January, the new politics, whatever they may be, come into play. Uh, the new year, new budgets, which we spent many shows discussing budgetary influences on, come into play. Um, you have uh, a lot of the things that we decided that are going to be enacted come next year. And for all of us in a historical sense, as just human beings, a fiscal change of year, change of fiscal change of mind. Bright, new, shiny year. Uh, just like waking up the next morning, it's like it's a new day. Well, the year is a larger expression of that. We're going into 2023. And what is different about this? Um, some things I feel that are impacting us that aren't just about the political landscape that we just discussed in detail is also to the ramifications of the recession. I believe that this is our last non-financially influenced or lesser in financially influenced holiday purchase season where people are going to buy out of interest. I think this is the last of our revenge travel demand where people are like, finally, like, man, I'm getting out. This is the first holiday that I'm going to go all in. You know, uh, last Christmas, last Thanksgiving, we felt that that was a thing. That was a thing. And it did manifest itself last year that there was a extension of length of stay for Thanksgiving. We're going to spend more time with the family. But there was still the issue and the worry of a very present COVID surge at that time. And it was, let's be safer. And so now that worry seems to be in the back rear view mirror for, mirror for a lot of people. Um, and so for that reason, this is probably the closest to a what used to be normal holiday season. I think there are people that are looking to enjoy what they can try to do financially. There's a lot of people that got hired recently, so they have their income. Um, but again, warning red flags about the lack of expansion for large retail, the, the fact that we're already seeing demand shifts that the, the demand for demand sake of, okay, I'm going to get back out there. The, the corporate traveler that's getting back out there, the conferencer that's getting back to conferences, the groups that are saying, getting back to my weddings and my Smurf business and so forth, that's going to be into to plateau and then realign to seasonal demand. We're going into winter, whether it starts early or it starts late, it's still going to be winter, January, February, March. we got spring going in. What's the demand interest in spring when rates continue to escalate for for interest, when credit card bills for holiday come due come February, how are those impacts going to influence the, well, we really we really pushed and splurged over the holidays. So this spring break, I know last spring we took a week here or five days here or something. We're going to just lay a little lower this year. We, we don't have that much money to spend and or it's still too expensive to do this. Cost of living is still too high. We still have that going on right now. So I think that come January, a lot of what we see Amazon and Walmart doing by saying, 
let's just put a barrier and, and put a fence around this for right now. We need to consider aspects of that as well. Optimism is wonderful. Hope is great. But reality is planned for the opposite of that as well. What happens if? And we talked about that in many shows as to creating contingency plans. What if I take this entire channel contribution out of the picture? How does that affect my cost in my operations? What happens if this goes away? What happens if this happens? We talked about it in many ways way back when in relationship to lockdowns and the politics of changing local uh, abilities for people to operate as businesses. And then it morphed into the what happens if our channel shifts and we don't get business from this channel the way we anticipated or that this is not a functioning value for us anymore. And running those worst case scenarios through workflows and, and, and funnels to determine what the impact of that would be. And do you have a counter plan to see how you can augment that? Um, that is very real now. Those discussions are as more legitimate now than they were even when we had them for the reasons we had them then. That to go through your crisis, worst case scenario relationship discussions now so that if any of those things happen, you have immediate ability to have the plan that you had put in place if it's still applicable. Um, if it doesn't happen, then great, over planning. That's fine but at least you had that and it always can be available and adapted to something else in the future that we don't get to have happen. So those are the things that I think we have to look at coming up to January is that we are dealing with a transition in economy, transition in politics, a transition in what is next? What are we, you know, are we past the COVID uh, concern as an impact on our business? Is it really regulated now to a flu-like condition or is it going to morph into something else? Um, you have people that are on both sides of the political spectrum. You know, uh, the people that are against Fauciism for, um, name, made for somebody that was, anyway, uh, you know, as to how much do you keep worrying about this or do you just accept that it's a risk of life and that it's something that you have to know is there, but you can't have it create a fear for you, a phobia. These are very real considerations. The, the, the truth of it is, is from a political perspective on both sides for our business, there's an ounce of truth in both of them, but there's not a pound of truth in, in all of it. Uh, that somewhere between those pits of truth is a commonality of acceptance that we all have in our business operations. How we are a part of our community dictates how we represent our business. The demand to our market and the politics that guide our local markets have a tremendous influence on our success in how we can drive business to ourselves, our ability to have regulation that allows us to run the business to its full potential rather than to its limiting political climate. Um, the interest in our market is based on a variety of things from security uh, to climate, to ethnic densities, to uh, tolerances, and just general perceptions. Uh, nothing is black and white, which means nothing is blue and red. There is shades between all of that. We are much more diverse than color charts and maps of the lower 48 represent themselves. We have to know our sensitivity to our local market. We also have to know the infrastructure that supports our local market. Are people able to get to us? Airlines decide carrier lift based on a variety of factors. And there is a variety of factors, including pilot shortages, aircraft shortages, cost for terminals, cost for gate fees, and so forth, that as local politics decide what they're going to charge, okay, and exploit, airlines might say it's not worth it for us to run that lift to you anymore. There's a ramification factor that the you know, politics say, well, you know, we want to charge twice as much for the gate fees at our local airport. And the, the, the airline that's running the gate says, yeah, well, we don't want to use it anymore. Thanks, and we're out. And that affects other businesses that required on that lift to come in. And these are the choices and influences coming on. So I would say out of all recommendations as a business owner in your community, be in tune with your community in multiple ways, not just as an active supporter of your community and a part of the community in, in, in ways of showing up for and participating in, but also be very sensitive to the nuances of the political leaders that are put in place, whether you chose them to be there or not, you have to be aware of their perspectives on the things that influence your business. And for that reason, you need to solicit and find out what the true decision ideas, if they don't already have a record of making decisions, are of the people you're putting into place from this midterm election. And that will help you guide what you need to do, either to influence the next choice of person that sits in that chair or influence the person that's sitting in that chair in a way that can be helpful for your business interests. Lobbying. 
those are the things. And there's lots of things as a hospitality in, in a business that you can do to influence that. Everybody needs hotel rooms. Everybody needs uh, meeting venues. Everybody needs restaurants. If you're any one of those things that have that resource, you have an influence on the politics of your community. You have a way of engaging yourself with people that have the power of decision in your community. And I highly recommend you become very much engaged with that. You might find that there's a huge new value in you as a citizen in your community. The fact that you can help in many ways with your business. So there we have it. The politics of travel. Um, I hope maybe just out of the general discussion, you've thought of new perspectives as to how this influences your choices and your outlook going into 2023. We do have Thanksgiving coming up in the continental United States. Uh, we do have Christmas and Hanukkah so forth coming up in December. Uh, these are all things that are going to influence our business in the upcoming six weeks. Uh, we can't be just looking just past them, but from a good marketing perspective, we have to look in the longer run, not just what this weekend's holding. We can influence some of it to some degree, but most of it we can influence more later on. So keep that in mind. So there you have it. Um, thank you very much for watching us on Roku, Google, Amazon, and Apple. Google, Roku, Amazon, Apple, and them all four. Uh, on our TV channel, Hospitality Channel. If you're watching us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, or YouTube, thank you so much for the live coverage of that. For everyone that watches us on the recording or listens to me later on the recording, uh, thank you so very much for taking the time to do so. Our podcast today will be a little bit about information and research discovery, how to follow and look at trends, how to look at and follow and, 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 and research data on things like uh, Lyft and Insights and so forth. Um, uh, we're going to get into some specific tools to do that. So it'll be, as we always, related to our live show we just did. Um, that will be in our podcast today. Um, as always, you can uh, watch all of the reruns of our previous shows, 378 of them, and now 379 of them at the hospitalitychannel.tv. If you don't and haven't watched us on TV, you can watch us at talktravel.tv is the website connection to it. But just go on your Roku, Amazon, Apple, or um, Amazon, Amazon, or Google uh, channel. Our product, you know, uh, Fire Sticks for Amazon and Google for, for Google and, and Roku, Roku. Uh, and look for Hospitality Channel. Uh, the show's always on the free side of the border of it. Uh, there is a paid component of content behind it uh, monthly, just like on Netflix is, $4.99 a month to have. The price goes down the longer you want to sign up. Uh, and it's if you join our Hospitality Marketing Club, hospitalitymarketing.club, uh, that club is for uh, journeymen and experienced hospitality marketers. We have a peer group. It's not about basic training. We're not here to teach you the basics. You, the only way you can join, as a matter of fact, you have to pass a quiz to get on it, uh, is that you are already fluent in this space. It's about getting a good peer relationship discussion with people that are knowledgeable in the space already so you can ask more advanced questions. Uh, but the TV channel subscription comes along with the Hospitality Club membership. So that's the only reason why I brought it up. So with all of that, my name is Lauren Gray. I thank you for the privilege of your time. Uh, and I do look forward to talking to you show number 380 next week. So with that, have a great day and thank you very much.